Yes, Ms. Powers. I can tell you that we have read the judge's two judgments and the skeleton arguments. I'm very grateful, my lord. May it please your lordship, so I appear on behalf of the appellant for HH Aluminium and Building Projects Limited and Mr. Peter Robert House. They are the fourth and fifth respondents to the underlying originating application. Yeah. And then my friend Mr. Fenner appears on behalf of the respondents who are the trustees in bankruptcy in the Pella Arts. Could I ask you to speak up a bit? Of course, my lord. Uh, the applicants in the underlying originating application. As your Lordships will be aware, this is an appeal from two orders of His Honour Judge Matthews. The first is an order dated the 4th of February of this year, which was made by the learned judge sitting as a judge of the County Court. That order transferred from the County Court to the High Court an application made by the appellants dated the 14th of October last year. The second order is dated the 12th of February 2020, albeit also following a hearing on the 4th of February. And that was made by the learned judge sitting as a High Court judge on the application dated the 14th of October. There is one ground of appeal in respect to the County Court order and four grounds of appeal in respect to the High Court yep. order. My Lords, I propose to submit my submissions into three substantive parts. Uh, the first will address ground one and the question of the power of the learned judge to transfer our application from the County Court to the High Court. Secondly, I will deal, in a sense, collectively with grounds three through to five and the issue of whether the learned judge was wrong to dismiss my application dated the 14th of October in respect of striking out the originating application. And finally, I will address, um, shortly I hope, the sixth ground uh, as to whether the learned judge was wrong to refuse summary judgment. Uh, yes. On your indication, my Lord, unless it would assist the court, I don't propose to rehearse either the factual or procedural background to either the originating application or this appeal. No. I mean, you may need to take us to the facts when you get on to the summary judgment part of, course, of your submissions. Of course, my Lord, I will. Um, but for the procedural aspects, uh, it's probably not necessary. No, I, I agree, my Lord. Starting then with the first ground of appeal... The issue which was before the learned judge on the respondent's application to transfer was a short one of construction. In essence, whether Rule 12.30 of the Insolvency England and Wales Rules 2016 confers jurisdiction to transfer a single application made in the course of insolvency proceedings, in this case bankruptcy proceedings, from the County Court to the High Court, I should say, for the avoidance of doubt, my lords, that it was common ground both between myself and, and my learned friend, and indeed with the judge, that there is, of course, jurisdiction to transfer the entirety of insolvency proceedings. By the entirety of insolvency proceedings, you mean the bankruptcy itself, and, uh, and uh, all the applications in the bankruptcy? Uh, yes, my lord. In effect, the application or petition that would commence the relevant insolvency proceedings, in this case, bankruptcy, and then everything which followed thereafter. Uh, whether it be applications against the bankrupt or against third parties, as in this case. Does that power to retransfer back the entire proceeding? Yes, my lord. And in fact, what, uh, I will come on to this, but what is noted is, uh, in Muir Hunter, for example, is in respect of, say, a block transfer order, whereas there, there is a change in office holder, yes. what may occur is the transfer of the entirety of proceedings to the High Court simply for the purpose of making that block transfer order, and then a transfer back to the originating court of the whole proceeding. Is there any practical difference between transferring the October application alone and transferring the entire bankruptcy for the purpose of determining the October application and then transferring the whole file back? I think I would have to accept that if the application that had been made by the respondents was to transfer the entirety of the bankruptcy proceedings, then we wouldn't be here. But that was not the application made and it was not the application determined. It was very specifically a transfer of the application made on the 14th of October by my clients, and for that specific purpose of, in effect, escaping precedent established by the Kelkman Holmes case. Well, that goes to the reason for the transfer, it not does. the power. It does, but it does And, and the judge here was sitting in Bristol, I think, uh, in the same building. Yes. So all this stuff about transferring the file doesn't seem to do anything, because it's where it is. 
Yes, Mary, and that was a point made by his Honour Judge Matthews, and again, I'll come on to it. Yeah. But the point, the procedural points about what happens to the file are, of course, relevant to construing parliamentary mm. intention in Rule 12.30. Um, so whilst I accept that, of course, practically, the learned judge had a point in relation to Bristol, that point doesn't necessarily sound in respect of all county courts, uh, and also doesn't really assist in what was intended when one construes the rules as a whole. Yes. Can I ask you another question? Of course, my Lord. Which is, if you are right on this, where, where does that leave you? It leaves you with the subsequent decision in the High Court being invalid. Yes. So you start again in the County Court with your October application. You go before a County Court judge. It might be his own Judge Matthews, it might be another County Court judge. That judge is banned by Reed Calcran, um, so is banned to follow Reed Calcran. There's then an appeal. And then you have the argument all over again in the High Court? My Lord, I've considered this point, um, obviously, because one has to wonder what is the point of our ground one. Yes. I think there are two ways of looking at this. Um, firstly, this court, and I suspect this will be the view your Lordships take, this court could take the view that, in effect, the, ju the judgment of the learned judge below was irregular because of a substantial irregularity in transferring when he had no power to do so. But we are in effect here now, and this court can determine my client's application of the 14th of October, in a sense, afresh. Um, but having regard to the comments that the learned judge below made in distinguishing his position from that in Reed Calcrim, um, the alternative view to take is that, in effect, um, the judgment below was wholly irregular. Um, if, as, as you say, my lord, His Honour Judge Matthews hadn't transferred our application, he would have been bound by Reed Calcrone and therefore would have acceded to our application. And really that ends there. The fact that, in effect, the respondents are then denied what would have been a right of appeal to the High Court is really of their own making because they made the application to transfer in circumstances when there was no power to do so. So I, I think there are two alternative approaches, but I suspect your Lordships will favour the first, and indeed that would avoid additional costs I think what neither party would want of this being remitted to the county court in the process. Well, by definition, yeah. in an insolvency, almost by definition, in an insolvency, there's not enough money to go around to pay all the creditors. So money saving becomes rather important. Indeed, my lord. Going back to then um, my client's case in respect of this first ground, um, what is said by my clients is that the learned judge below wrongly and unnecessarily construed Rule 12.30 as reading that there is a power to transfer insolvency proceedings or any application made in insolvency proceedings. That, in my submission, was an error of law. Had, in fact, His Honour Judge Matthews had proper regard to three things, the first being the definition of insolvency proceedings in the 2016 rules and the EU regulation. Secondly, being the other relevant provisions of the insolvency rules. And finally, earlier legislation and judicial interpretation of that legislation. Then the learned judge would, and indeed should, have dismissed the respondent's application to transfer. I will address those three aids to construction, as it were, in turn. Firstly, beginning with the statutory definition of insolvency proceedings. My learned friend states in his skeleton argument that the term insolvency proceedings should be given its natural meaning. However, in my submission, there is no need to consider the ordinary or natural meaning of the term when there is already a definition in the rules. It is trite that where a term is defined in legislation, then the legislation must be construed in accordance with that definition. It is notable in my submission that in his judgment, His Honour Judge Matthews did not refer to the statutory definition of insolvency proceedings. He was wrong not to do so, and that failure led to the error of law in interpreting Rule 12.30. My Lord, you have at tab five with the authorities bundle extracts from the 2016 rules. And I will begin with rule 1.1, which defines the scope of the 2016 rules. 
and it does so by express reference to both the 1986 Act and the EU regulation. Sub Rule 2 offers the starting point for the meaning of the term insolvency proceedings. In summary, unless the context requires otherwise, references to insolvency proceedings are to be read as references to proceedings in respect of parts 1 to 11 of the 86 Act and the EU regulation. My Lords, I pause there to emphasise the centrality of the concept of that definition in understanding the 2016 rules. It is right at the start of the rules, a marked comparison to the 1986 rules, where the definition of the term insolvency proceedings was found right at the very end in Rule 13.7. The introduction of the EU regulation affects and has a considerable impact on the way in which these rules work and the meaning of the terms within them. What is consistent in the reference to the 86 Act and the EU regulation is the definition referentially to types of insolvency procedure. So by saying that insolvency proceedings must be considered by reference to parts 1 to 11 of the Act, the references to the various heading, headings of those parts. Which part is section 423 in? Uh, part 16, my lord. So the, so the rules don't apply to the 43 application? No, it, it's an interesting point um, because when one looks at, which I will come to, the definition of insolvency proceedings in the insolvency practice direction, it is much broader and specifically states that se an application under section 423 when made in the context of insolvency proceedings falls within that definition. Um, that is different in my submission to the definition in the rules themselves where it is clear that because there is no reference to any part beyond part 11, an application under 423 would not fall within the definition of insolvency proceedings for purposes of the rules. Does that mean you can't use an application notice under the Insolvency Act to bring a section 423 claim? No, my lord, but it would mean that you cannot transfer an application under section 423 under the power in Rule 12.30. I think it's recognised that... Well, you'd have a power under the County Courts Act, would you? And all the CPR? I think yes, under the County Courts Act, because in Section 42.2, the County Court is able to transfer except where, in effect, not uh, where there is another statute that intercedes. Um, but because the insolvency rules wouldn't, because they do not... 12, well, rule 12.30 doesn't apply to 423, then the power would be found in 42.2. Having looked at the 1986 Act, the next step then is to consider the EU regulation. My Lord, you have that at tab 4 of the authority bundle. And in particular, in Article 2, there is in fact a definition of the term insolvency proceeding in Article 2.4. Again, there is a referential definition where insolvency proceedings is defined as meaning the proceedings listed in Annex A. And in the case of the United Kingdom, those proceedings are largely similar to the headings in Parts 1 to 11 of the Insolvency Act, winding up CV, CDL, administration voluntary arrangements, bankruptcy. Then having regard to sub rule 1.12, it must follow that the term insolvency proceedings throughout the rules, and indeed in rule 12.30, has to be interpreted consistently with that definition in the EU regulation. The reason why the term is defined referentially in the 2016 rules is because the earlier EU regulation already established in law the meaning of the term insolvency proceedings. Back to my first point then, insolvency proceedings having regard to the statutory definition should be understood as encompassing the entirety of proceedings in relation to a particular debtor or company under a particular insolvency procedure. So in the context of bankruptcy, what it means is petition or application which commences the bankruptcy process and everything which follows thereafter. 
Having considered the statutory definition, it may be this court needs to go no further. But your lordships, in my submission, both the other rules of the 2016 laws and earlier legislation support the statutory definition. Looking firstly then at the other rules, legislation of course must be read as a whole and so the other rules offer an interpretation that must be consistent. In his judgment, His Honour Judge Matthews did refer to the rules which follow Rule 12.30, but consideration of their meaning and effect formed no part of his judgment. Looking specifically at Rule 12.33, um, the point discussed earlier, my Lord, about the procedural requirements following a transfer order. There are two requirements. Firstly, the file of the proceedings must be delivered to the transferee court. And secondly, the official receiver attached to that court must be notified. As a matter of practice, as your lordships will know, uh, when a bankruptcy petition is presented or a winding up petition is presented, a case number is allocated. And thereafter, every application, whether originating or ordinary, in the context of those proceedings, bears the same case number and will be kept on the same file. The procedural provisions in Rule 12.33 requiring delivery of the file would make no sense and would be practically unworkable if Parliament had intended Rule 12.30 to authorise the transfer of a single application in insolvency proceedings. There would be a situation where, in respect of a single application, the file is sent to the transferee court, which only has jurisdiction over that particular application. Well, I, can we just tease that one out a little bit? Um, 12.33 says, where a court makes an order for the transfer of proceedings under Rule 12.30, it must, as soon as reasonably practical, deliver to the transferee court a sealed copy of the order and the file of the proceedings. The debate between you and Mr. Fennell is whether the proceedings can include a single application in the proceedings. If you are right, then obviously the whole file of the proceedings must be transferred. Yes. If, on the other hand, Mr. Fennell is right and the proceedings can include an application, then Rule 12.33 can, consistently with that, be interpreted so that the file of the application is delivered to the transferee court. My Lord, I accept literally that is possible, but in practice, as I've already said, there is a single case number allocated, and thus a single right. file. As far as I'm aware, there is no concept in insolvency of separating out particular applications. Well, can I come back to the circumstance we were discussing earlier of block, block transfers? Because I'm sure my Lord's had the same experience as, as I did when sitting in the Chancery Division, because you know, these were a regular feature of um, the insolvency work that we did. And you never got the entire file. Um, you would simply get the file relating to the block transfer application. And of course, it would be monstrous to suppose that um, the entirety of all of the files should be transferred. It would be just carting vast amounts of paper from place to place for no conceivable purpose. So is it really a sensible construction of this rule that it requires the entirety of the file always to be transferred? Well, Lord, I take the point, but what we're looking at is what Parliament intended. Um, your Lordship will have far more experience than me, practically, of what occurs um, in terms of how files are kept. But certainly my understanding, as I've said, is that there is a single case number and a single court file. Um, is there a definition of file? Uh, not that I'm aware of. The second point, of course, in terms of procedural requirement, is that 12.33 requires notification to the official receiver attached to the transferee court. Um, now, again, I accept not an issue in Bristol, um, but it may be the case, um, particularly outside of London or major cities, 
that the county court is some distance and or has a different official receiver attached to it than the receiving High Court District Registry. And in that case, there is a risk, therefore, of duplication of costs, which, as my Lord has already noted, is entirely undesirable in the context of insolvency proceedings and quite possibly creates confusion as to the role of those official receivers. Yeah. The final point in terms of construing these rules relates to the progression of the law in this area and the judicial <coughs> interpretation of it. This formed a substantive part of the learned judge Belay's reasoning as to why he had power to transfer a single application. My Lord, I've in, uh, included at tab 17 of the authorities bundle extracts from Bellion on statutory interpretation. Um, yeah. The principles therein will be, of course, familiar to your Lordships. Um, but what is said there, and I respectfully adopt, is that when adopting a purposive approach to construing a particular provision, it is essential to take into account the state of the previous law. The Insolvency Act 1986 and the 2016 rules are part of a developing series of legislation relating to bankruptcy in English law stemming back hundreds of years. It is in my submission therefore relevant and necessary to, in the words of Bennion, trace the course of this development in construing the existing insolvency legislation. <coughs> now, I entirely Am I wrong in thinking that the, 20, sorry, the 1986 rules in particular I appreciate the Act is perhaps more debatable, but the rules in particular were intended to be a new code, a bit like the CPR. My Lord, I take the point, and I was about to go on and say that caution, of course, needs to be exercised in this context, because the 1986 uh, legislation was such a watershed in insolvency procedure uh, and uh, the procedures available in this country. My, my learned friend has rightly noted in his skeleton the comments of Lord Newberger in the Lehman Brothers and the Four. I think there was a House of Lords case right in the early days of the Insolvency Act which said it's a new, it's a new start, it's a clean sheet effectively. Yes, but what is also said by Lord Newberger in the passage cited by my learned friend is that prima facie, if there is the same or similar wording in respect to a particular context, then normally it can be assumed that the effect of the provision was intended to be unadulterated. And that, in, in my submission laws, is simply an expression of the well-known Barris principle, which is set out in the extract from Bennion in the authorities bundle. I accept that previous legislation and the judicial interpretation thereof is at most an inference as to the particular meaning of a later statute. But it is helpful in this context to look at the evolution of these particular rules as to transfer, because whilst the 1986 legislation was a watershed, these provisions have in fact remained largely unchanged. We begin, my lords, with the Bankruptcy Act of 1914 and section 100 therein, which is at tab one of the authorities bundle. Sorry, which um, tab? Tab one, my lord. Tab one. And it's the last page of the yep. tab. At section 101 is a, a familiar statement that all the courts throughout England have jurisdiction, now reflected in section 375 of the Insolvency Act. And at subsection 2 is the power to transfer, a general discretion in effect to transfer proceedings from court to court. The Bankruptcy Act 1914 was later supported by the Bankruptcy Rules 1952, which are at tab 2 of the authorities. The relevant rules are from 21 onwards, which deal with transfer of proceedings. At Rule 21 is the power of the High Court to order a transfer from the County Court to the High Court or vice versa. At Rule 22 is the power of the County Court judge to transfer 
to another county court. Um, I pause to note, my Lord, that under the Bankruptcy Rules 1952, unlike the 86 Rules and the 2016 Rules, there was no power for a county court judge to transfer to the High Court. What is noticeable in the 1952 Rules are the following provisions, which, although in slightly different wording, offer similar procedural requirements in Rules 24 and 25 as to the transferring of the file, in effect, and the notification of the official receiver. That section of the Bankruptcy Act 1914 and those rules have been subject to two High Court decisions as to their meaning and effect, both of which were cited to His Honour Judge Matthews and which are considered in his judgment. The first, uh, a 1956 decision of Mr Justice Upjohn, is in re Puyumajan, one week law reports 558, which is at tab 7 of the authority front. It is a case where what was sought by the trustee was a transfer of a particular application where the bankruptcy was being administered in the Manchester County Court. The wording of section 102 was considered and Mr Justice Upjohn concluded, having construed the words of that provision, notably where the, red line, the black line is on page 561, that the subsection was only concerned with transferring the entirety of proceedings, as such that he had no power to transfer a single application in the context of bankruptcy proceedings. That decision was then approved Scott in the case of In Re Debtor, uh, 1985, one week law report six, which is at tab eight of the authorities bundle. Why then did the bankruptcy rules talk about any matter rather than proceedings? And if you look at rule 26, for instance, says a matter transferred from one court to another shall receive any distinctive number. And the, the power of transfer is not simply to order the proceedings, but the proceedings in any matter under the Act to be transferred. Well, well, why, why would that not have given the power? My Lord, I suspect the distinction is that... Um, Mr Justice Upton doesn't seem to have looked at that word. In the no, um, the distinction, obviously, in the previous legislation as compared to post-1986 is that the <coughs> general power was found in the Act, whereas the rules simply gave more information to the I procedure. See. Of course, everything now is within the rules. I follow. So primarily, of course, Mr Justice Upton was construing the Act where the term proceedings is used. Right. But he seemed to think that the rules supported a narrow construction as opposed to a broad construction question is, is that right? Yes. Um, well, I, was, I think it's simply an evolution of terminology um, before any interference by EU legislation. Um, so what is being referred to in the Act transfer of proceeding and of course that takes primacy over the rules. Sure, but, but you could you can argue the point the other way around, which is to say, okay, the Act talks about transfer of proceedings. We look at the rules and we see the proceedings are distinguished from matters. Um, why can one not take the view that a proceeding is actually narrow, is something less than a matter? and therefore can incorporate part of the matter. If one takes matter to refer to what is now, say, contained within the de definition of insolvency proceedings, so proceedings under part one or 10 or whatever it may be of the insolvency act, um, then this is, a, in my submission, expounded definition of saying that any anything that is occurring within the sphere of that particular type of insolvency procedure may be ordered to be transferred.
transferred. Um, but I would simply emphasise, my Lord, again, the primacy of the wording of the Act as opposed to the rules, um, a distinction that has lessened considerably with the enactment of the 1986 yeah. insolvency rules and really their wholesale control over insolvency procedure. Um, some might say that matters in insolvency rules might properly have been dealt with in the Insolvency Act, but, but there we are. Yeah. But at any rate, you've got two High Court decisions in your favour on the previous statutory regime. Uh, we're not hearing an appeal against yeah, either of those decisions. Um, uh, we've got the point. Um, you, in effect, you say, well, the Barris principle applies and the rules must be, the current rules must be taken to have proceeded on the footing that those two cases were rightly decided. Yes, my lord. I think I should then appropriately deal with the authority that is prima facie against me and the one... Is that Mr Justice Coulson's case? It, indeed, my yeah. lord. Um, that, of course, again dealt with earlier legislation, but the 1986 rules as opposed to anything that's pre-1986. Yeah. Um, there was a distinction between the current rules uh, in, in the sense that they use the term insolvency proceedings and the 1986 rules, which referred to a power to transfer winding up or bankruptcy proceedings or proceedings related to a debt relief order. So narrower in my submission than the current definition of insolvency proceedings. Similarly, the rules that followed what was then Rule 7.11 of the 1986 rules maintained the procedural requirements following transfer as to the delivery of the court file and notification to the official receiver. Looking then at the decision of Mr Justice Coulson in Hall and Van der Heijden, 2010, What is important is that this decision is not concerned with an application to transfer. It is concerned with a position where on the business day before a considerable trial, the defendant had obtained an interim order preventing proceedings against him pending an individual voluntary arrangement. On the morning of trial, therefore, Mr Justice Coulson was faced with the issue of construing power in section 2521B of a court to give leave for proceedings to continue. That was the application before Mr Justice Coulson and the application that he determined. The issue of construction before Mr Justice Coulson was whether what was meant, what is meant by the court in section 2522B of the Insolvency Act and not what was meant by the terminology in Rule 12 of what is was then Rule 7.11 of the 1986 rules. Within the judgment, there is no consideration of the proper construction of Rule 7.11, and in particular, what is meant by bankruptcy proceedings. What was actually on foot in the Swindon County Court in that case was an application for an interim order, no more. Query then whether it can even be said that bankruptcy proceedings were on foot when what was being contemplated by the defendant was an individual voluntary arrangement in a separate part of the Insolvency Act 1986. <coughs> Had Mr Justice Coulson considered his powers under Rule 7.11 by reference to the words used, being the power to transfer winding up or bankruptcy proceedings or proceedings relating to a debt relief he might well have concluded that Rule 7.11 in fact had no application in these particular circumstances because there were no bankruptcy proceedings to transfer. It is also fairly unclear in my respectful submission when one looks at paragraph 22 of the judgment exactly what Mr Justice Coulson considered he was transferring. Um, one sees it in the first sentence of paragraph uh, on this alternative analysis, the only other point that arises is whether or not a single part of the bankruptcy proceedings, if that is what this trial is, can be transferred. Of course, there was no transfer of the trial taking place, nor could it be said that the trial was part of the bankruptcy proceedings, not that there were any in my submission. The two High Court decisions that I've already referred to your Lordships to are not referred to in this judgment, presumably were not cited to Mr Justice Coulson probably going back to the point that he wasn't in fact considering an application
information to transfer. The final point that makes the decision in this of justice course in parenchyrium as to the particular provisions of transfer is that there is a passage cited from Muir Hunter in paragraph 22 of that judgment. The authors of Muir Hunter now take a different view to what was expounded in that edition. Uh, well, is that correct? I mean, it's a bit odd when you look at the current version because they simply cite the old authorities despite citing this authority in a different context. Uh, my Lord, I entirely concur that certainly um, looking at tab 18 and the extract from your answer, um, the general note at 7A3571 refers to what we've already discussed about transferring to the purpose of a block transfer order, and then notes that the above paragraph is cited with approval. Um, well, I'm not entirely sure that the passage that was cited by Mr Justice Coulson says what is currently said in that paragraph. Um, but for all my purposes, what is important is what was said in the very final paragraph, paragraph 7A3573, um, that the transfer rules do not provide for situations where the applicant for transfer does allow us to transfer only a part of the proceedings, meaning the whole insolvent case, and then cites the two high court cases I've already referred your lordships to. Muir Hunter's wrong, though, isn't he? The above paragraph was not cited by Mr Justice Court. He cited a different paragraph. Yes, I, I think that must be right. My, my Lord, I must confess, I, I don't quite follow. I don't know whether this is an attempt by the authors of Muir Hunter to rectify what was in the previous edition. But this is dealing with something completely different, yes. but not what Mr Justice Coulson was citing at all. No, and certainly the passage cited by Mr Justice Coulson seems to affirm what Mr Justice Coulson read it as saying, that he had the power to transfer. Yeah. Um, but really the point that I make in respect of this is that um, the addition referred to by Mr Justice Coulson cannot have contained the paragraph that I have just read out. Uh, and if it did and that had been cited to him, then he would not have concluded against his, that express wording that no power to transfer a single application exists, that Muir Hunter was in any way an authority approving his reasoning in saying that he did have jurisdiction to transfer. Right. Taking all of that then together, my lords, um, the common thread in my submission dating back to the 1914 Act is the use of the word proceedings. It must therefore be the case that earlier judicial decisions as to the meaning of that word proceedings are of assistance, albeit not in any way binding, uh, and no more than an influence, in construing the 2016 rules. Importantly for my purposes, those earlier judicial decisions in my submission support the literal construction of insolvency proceedings in Rule 12.30 that I have already set out by reference to the statutory definition. It is also worth noting that despite the considerable changes introduced by the 1986 legislation, what has been consistent is that the power to transfer is always set within the same context, along with procedural rules requiring the sending of the court file to the transferee court and the notification of the official receiver. I therefore invite your lordships to find that Isaiah Judge Matthews was wrong in his construction of 12.30. Before I leave this ground, my lordships, I think it is right that I address the insolvency practice direction, as that was relied on by the learned judge below, and indeed by my learned friend, as an aid to construction of meaning of insolvency proceedings. The first point to be made is that it is wrong to rely upon a practice direction as an aid to construction. Um, practice directions have no legislative force, has been, has, as has been noted repeatedly by the courts and summarised in the decision of Lord Justice Brooke in You and Liverpool City Council 2005-1 law reports, which uh, your lordships have at tab 11 of the authorities that we can provide as necessary to refer to it. The reasoning, of course, is that practice directions are not laid before Parliament and have not been through any democratic process. Additionally, the Insolvency Practice Direction was not brought into force until the 4th of July 2008, after the drafting, uh, sorry, 4th of July 2018, 
uh, after the drafting and coming into force of the 2016 rules. Since the insolvency practice direction is not contemporaneous with the 2016 rules, in my submission it cannot assist in determining Parliament's legislative intent within Rule 12.30. There was a previous practice direction, insolvency practice direction, wasn't there? Uh, so the practice direction, my Lord, that is contained within this bundle, uh, as far as I re can recall, is the previous practice direction. There is now. Was there not one before 2018? I would have to check. I don't know if my name is My Lord, I might be able to assist on that point. Um, there, there, there was, and there has been for many years. That's what I thought. But the point is the 2018 practice direction came in when the business and property courts were brought in. And so prior to 2018, um, if you brought an application in a bankruptcy in a county court, um, that didn't have insolvency jurisdiction like Southampton here. It would stay in Southampton unless the Southampton court chose to send it out or somebody chose to make the application to transfer it. What the new practice direction does is require all non-local business to be reviewed by a specialist judge in the appropriate hearing centre and that judge decides whether or not to keep it or to send it back. I see. And so the provisions that I relied on uh, below and that my learning friend referring to came in for the first time in 2018. That's part 316, is it? Oh, I've got 3.6. Three, 3. Yes, six. my lord, yes. 3.6, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very grateful to my learning friend, and that is, of course, the relevance of the 2018 practice direction, and particularly since uh, paragraph 3.6 was relied upon in particular to construe the meaning of the transfer provisions in the children's. All right, but, but can we go back to the point that was raised earlier? Because as you helpfully um, confirmed earlier, when we look at the definition of insolvency proceedings in the practice direction, 1.1 paragraph 6, yeah. it expressly extends the definition to an application made pursuant to 423 um, with the, the, the words in an insolvency context. So first of all, can you help me as to what is meant by in an insolvency context? Um, and secondly, what is the effect, if any, of the PD extending the definition to something which is not covered by the rules? My Lord, yes. So, point us to section 423 if it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, an application doesn't have to be, isn't always made when either an individual is made bankrupt or a company is placed into liquidation. It is a provision that can be used outside of the context of insolvency, where it is said um, by the terminology used is a victim, that a particular transaction has prejudiced them. So you don't need to establish, as part of your cause of action under Section 423, that the debtor has become insolvent? No, exactly, my lord. Uh, uh, and that point really founded the differing judgments in the judgment of this court in Hill and Spread Trustee as to the applicable limitation period to Section 423, um, because there are potentially many different people who could bring a cause of action under that section. And so the discussion in that case as to whether the appointment of a trustee in bankruptcy, for example, was itself a starting point for limitation, stemmed from the fact that there may be more than one limitation period applicable to an action under that section. It may be brought by the victim themselves or someone on their behalf, or may be brought by the office holder once appointed, either in a bankruptcy or in a liquidation. Your second point, my Lord, was to the relevance and effect of the fact that there is a broader definition of insolvency proceedings in the practice direction <coughs> than in the rules. Um, my answer to that is, is short, my Lord. Um, I note that, and that is a further reason why the insolvency practice, practice direction is not an aid to construction of the rules when there is already a definition in the rules. Um, and as noted in the Liverpool City Council case by Lord Justice Brooke, um, if a practice direction contains an incorrect statement of law, which it has been accepted that some do on occasion, it simply has no authority. 
uh, this court must consider the parliamentary intent behind mm -hmm. the rules. Can I go back to what my Lord, Lord Justice Arnold asked, which is what does in an insolvency context mean? Does that mean where the debtor has been made insolvent, or does it mean where the Section 43 application is brought by the office of? Uh, in, my, in my submission, it must include both. So once you've been made bankrupt, any Section 43 application by any victim has to be brought as insolvency proceedings within the practice of action. Yes, uh, there are obvious policy considerations for that, because of course the aim of a Section 43 application may be to put a particular creditor in a better position than yes. as against the other creditors. Thank you. The relevant paragraph of the practice direction relied upon and uh, quoted uh, by Sarah Judge Matthews would be 3.6. Um, what that paragraph refers to is the ability to transfer, in summary, either an application or petition for the commencement of insolvency proceedings or any application or petition within existing insolvency proceedings. What is clear then is that the insolvency practice direction also maintains a distinction between insolvency proceedings on the one hand and any application or petition within insolvency proceedings on the other hand. That is an indication that the draftsman was aware and uh, considering a consistent interpretation of the term insolvency proceedings in the rules. I I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry if I'm making asking a question to which the answer is obvious or I should be able to see the answer. But it's something that I find deeply puzzling. Um, the claim here is a claim under section 423, correct? Uh, and other sections, yes. But let's focus on the 423 claim. Now what we've established, I think, is that although that claim falls within the definition of insolvency proceedings in the practice direction, it's not within the definition of insolvency proceedings in the rules. Why, therefore, is the Section 423 claim in any sense part of the bankruptcy proceedings as defined in the rules? It seems to me at the moment it's not. Lord, it goes back to what are insolvency proceedings, as I, as I, and as I say, it's the point, the application or petition which commences, and then everything thereafter. So if one was looking at what the learned judge could have done in this case, it would have been to transfer the entirety of the bankruptcy. That would include an application made by the trustee thereafter. So what one wouldn't be looking at then is a transfer simply of the originating application in this case. And I accept there would be issues under Rule 12.30 because of the inclusion of 423, but rather the transfer of the entirety of the bankruptcy of Mrs. Ide. But, but I think the question I'm asking is, I take the point that there's power under the rules to transfer the entirety of insolvency proceedings as defined. Mm -hmm. But does that power extend to transferring a claim made which is not within the definition of insolvency proceedings purely on the basis that, for reasons that I'm struggling to understand, that, that claim is made within the context of the insolvency proceedings? <laughs> Seems all, all a bit paradoxical to me. I think well, what one has to go back to is the purpose and uh, what has, uh, my learned friend has cited is the importance of geography in bankruptcy proceedings. For hundreds of years, the relevant court in respect of a debtor or a company has been tied to where that person is located for obvious policy reasons that generally where someone lives is where their assets tend to be. Though I accept as we in increase multinationalism, that is perhaps not so much the case. So the importance of maintaining insolvency proceedings together is to ensure an effective, cost-effective um, administration of the bankrupt estate or the company's um, assets. So what the power in Rule 12.30 is ultimately looking to preserve is maintaining the bankruptcy proceedings, in this case, or insolvency proceedings, together so that everything moves 
with each other. So, my lord, I said. How important is that policy? A, given the single county court, and B, given the advent of electronic file? My lord, it must still be important because of the rules prescribing where insolvency proceedings must be commenced, still being tied to the notion of a home court. Even though that notion is now actually inconsistent with the legislation about the county court? Yes. But of course, it, I mean, it's still the case, my lord, that not every county court, even though there is only one county court, not every hearing centre has insolvency jurisdiction. And that has always been the case. Well, I know we've asked you a lot of questions, uh, Ms Powers, but um, there are still quite substantial points to get through on your other appeal. There are, my lord. I was intending to move on unless I could assist yeah. further. As my Lord rightly notes, um, grounds three to five are really the heart of this appeal. What the learned judge had before him was an application, uh, a twofold application by my clients. Um, the first and principal part of the application sought to set aside what was understood between all parties and the judge to be an order which had the effect of extending time for service of the originating application. And then as a consequence to strike out the originating application. Before the learned judge, there were therefore three issues. The first is whether, on a proper construction of Rule 12.9 of the 2016 rules, um, what date were the respondents required to serve the originating application? Was it 14 days before the hearing endorsed on the application notice, or 14 days before the first effective hearing? The second issue is if the respondents were required to serve the originating application 14 days before the date endorsed on the application notice, what was the relevance of limitation having expired between issuing the originating application and the application to vacate the hearing endorsed on the application notice or service of the application? And finally, if the respondents did require an extension of time because they didn't serve before the hearing endorsed on the application notice. And if the issue of limitation is relevant in this context, should the extension of time by way of the order of Deputy District Judge Hebblethwaite have been set aside, and then should the originating application have been struck out? The appellant's case is as follows, that in holding that the respondents did not require an extension of time for service of the originating application, His Honour Judge Matthews wrongly interpreted Rule 12.93 as simply requiring service 14 days before the first effective hearing of the application. In my submission, that was an error of law and of construction, which led to him wrongly dismissing the application on the basis there had been no failure by the respondents to comply with the rules as to service. If Ron Judge Matthews had in fact held, which he should have done in my submission on a proper construction of the rules, that the respondents were obliged to serve the originating application by the 25th of June last year, which would have been 14 days before the date endorsed on the application notice then he would have had to consider, which in any event he did overture, whether time for service of the originating application was rightly extended. In my submission, is Honourable Judge Matthews erred in law in his overture comments in stating that the principles explicable to extensions of time for service of a Part 7 claim, including considering the expiry of a limitation period after issue but before service, were not relevant. And secondly, erred in finding that the reasons advanced by the respondents for seeking an extension of time were good reasons which justified the extension of time in effect given. If this court is satisfied that His Honour Judge Matthews um, was wrong in law and that he should have indeed found that the respondents firstly required an extension of time for service, and secondly, that the principles relevant to extension of time for service of a claim form were relevant, albeit not directly applicable, then he would have concluded in my submission 
that the appellant had suffered prejudice by reason of the late service of the originating application and would have acceded to the application and set aside the extension of time and struck out the originating application. Uh, su suppose this had been a straightforward section 423 application uh, without insolvency. You would start that by claim form? Yes, I would suspect it has to be. You would then have four months in which to serve it. Um, and if you didn't serve it, you would have to ask for an extension of time for service, in which event considerations of limitation would loom large on Indeed. such an application. So the effect of the judge's decision in this case is that there is a huge difference between Section 423 application brought within the context of an insolvency and a Section 423 application brought outside. Yes, my lord. Insolvency. Or indeed, for example, between a Part 7 claim brought by a trustee or liquidator against a third party on behalf of a bankrupt or the company and an application made under Section 228 or 329 of the Insolvency Act. Well, a part, I mean, a part seven claim would not be trying to undo um, a preference, would it? No. You, you uh, would what do that within, I mean, you have to do that within the context of insolvency. You do, yes, my lord, but what a trustee might be doing would be to, say, claim a simple debt from a third yes, party. Yes, oh, of course. And that would be by way of a part yes. seven claim, in which case, on the learned judge's reasoning, all the concerns about extension of time would apply to that action by the trustee but not where the trustee is forced by statute to bring the proceedings by way of insolvency application notice rather than by part seven claim. What about the misfeasance? A liquidator can bring a claim against directors for misfeasance either as a standalone part seven claim or in the insolvency. Can yes, my lord. Uh, and that was the situation in the Elkhorn Homes. And indeed, Her Honour Judge Gordon Smith in that case noted that it would be odd if the liquidators in that case had chosen to proceed by way of part seven claim rather than a Section 212 application. All the issues as to limitation would have had to be considered if they proceeded by way of Part 7 claim, but applying the judge's reasoning in this case, not on the Section 212 application, which was why Her Honour Judge Smith in that case held that there has to be application by analogy, albeit well, not yeah, directly. I understand that point, but just for the avoidance of doubt, I take it you wouldn't dispute that if you imagine it being done by a way of claim for claim form can be issued on the last day of the limitation period yes. and can be is served on the last day of the four-month period for service. Yes. And that's all entirely regular and the poor defendant can't object and say, well, hold on a minute, in effect, you've got six years and four months here, yes. um, nearly, less two days, if you want to argue about those days. Um, they're stuck with it. Yes, my lord. As noted in, in Cecil and Barnett and the judgment of Lord Justice Ricks in um, the adept case, um, it is a feature of our procedural system that limitation stops in effect on the point of issue. But there is then a period in which service is permitted. And that is why the phrase... Quite. But there's an, am I right in understanding that there is absolutely nothing in the insolvency context that equates to the four months period for service, or six months if it's out of the jurisdiction, the four-month period for service in the CPR context. Yes, that is right. There is no equivalent of Rule 7.5 or 7.6 in the insolvency context. Um, but as uh, I will come on to, uh, but as John, Her Honour Judge Gordon Smith noted in Calcrone, the mere absence of that particular provision has not been a bar to the courts applying the principles applicable to extension of time. And she used the example of a Part 20 claim where quite often what the court does is give a direction that that be served by reference to a future hearing date, so 14 days before or whatever it may be. But in that case, there is authority that the principles still apply, even though not directly, because there is no equivalent to Rule 7.5 or 7.6 in the context of a Part 20 claim. Well, as if I can begin with um, really the, the ratio of the learned judge's decision. Um, and his determination that the requirement to serve in Rule 12.93 um, means simply serving before the first effective hearing. 
the basis of that construction is that the learned judge held that the wording in Rule 12.9.3 is ambiguous in that it can be read both ways, either as referring to the date endorsed on the, hit, the application notice or the date of the first effective hearing. I've already made the point, my Lord, that rules must be interpreted in light of other rules as a principle of statutory interpretation. My Lord, it's my error that the copies of the relevant rules for this part of my submissions are yes. not in the authorities. My Lord. Right. Um, I, I apologise for that, and I apologise to my learned friend. I do have spare copies, if that would assist. I think that would be helpful. Shall we put these in tab 5, which um, also yes. contain parts of section 12 of the rules? Yes, well, that's what I've done, just slotted behind rule 1.1. 1. 1. Yeah. Um, what you have handed us doesn't, I think, contain the definition of venue to which you refer in your skeleton argument. Is that in another section of this? Um, it isn't, my lord. I can provide that after lunch adjournment. Again, my apologies. Yes, all right. Well, I'll bring a Celia Milman after lunch as well. Uh, I'm very grateful, <laughs> my lord. My apologies again. The relevant provision that the learned judge was construing, um, as I said, is Rule 12.93, which in turn provides that a sealed copy of the application must be served uh, or notice of the application when you must be delivered at least 14 days before the date fixed for its hearing. If I take your lordships back to Rule 12.8, which naturally 12 point 12.8. Yes. So the term fixing the venue or similar is used in both of those rules, and so of course must be given a consistent meaning across both of those rules. The observation of this Honourable Judge Matthews is that Rule 12.8 doesn't require the court, or doesn't refer to, the fixing of a time or date, but just a venue. Um, but as I've said in my skeleton argument, that ignores the definition of venue, which I will provide to your Lordships after lunch, uh, in Rule 1.2 of the Insolvency Rules, which refers to venue meaning both time, date, and place or platform for the proceedings. It is clear in Rule 12.8 that the concept of fixing a venue is distinct from, for example, listing a hearing, because it is tied to what occurs when the application <coughs> is filed. Before the learned judge was a uh, decision of Deputy ICC Judge Prentice, as he then was in the case of Bree HS Work Limited. Um, you, you have that at tab 16 of the authorities bundle as you need to refer to it, my Lord. What Judge Prentice held is that there is a linguistic connection between Rule 12.9 and Rule 12.8, um, and that reasoning was rejected by His Honour Judge Matthews, and in my submission he was wrong to do so. Looking at, for example, Rule 12.8c, that is an exception to the obligation to fix the venue if Rule 12.12 .12 applies. Rule 12.12 .12 refers to the case where service of a sealed copy is not required. That exception then in Rule 12.8 connotes the fact that fixing a venue is tied to service, tied to notifying the respondent to the application of when the application is first listed to be heard. I don't understand the relationship between those at the moment. 
12.8 says court must fix a venue unless the case is one to which 12.12 applies. Yes. 12.12 applies where the Act doesn't require service of the sealed copy of the application. So 12.9 says the applicant must serve a sealed copy of the application unless the court directs all these rules provide otherwise. So where do these rules provide otherwise so as to disapply the requirement to serve a sealed copy of the application? It seems to be entirely circular. I, I'm sure there will be examples, my Lord, within the wider Act and the rules of it being possible to make without notice applications. Is it 12.10, an urgent case? Is that, yes, that's urgent what it, Is that what it's talking about? Uh, and indeed other cases where there was no respondent or a sealed application was needed to be made to Mr Barton. Um, the point I'm making, my Lord, is that um, why do the rules require fixing a venue? And it must be at least significantly in part um, connected to the concept of serving a sealed application which has upon it endorsed the first hearing. Hence why there is no obligation to fix a venue if in a particular case there is no requirement to serve. Perhaps more helpfully within Rule 12.9 itself, 12.9 sub rule 1 provides that what must be served is a sealed copy of the application endorsed with the venue, time and date for the hearing on the respondent. The phrase a sealed copy of the application is repeated in subsection 3. One queries why it would be any importance in serving a sealed copy of the application which has upon it endorsed the first listed, first fixed hearing. <coughs> if the words the date fixed for its hearing can be read as referring to the first effective hearing. In those circumstances, the point of serving an application notice with a hearing endorsed upon it is, is totally lost, it has no relevance, and that cannot be what the rules intended. Further, in Rule 12.93c, there is an exception to the requirement to serve 14 days before the date fixed for its hearing, and that exception is if the court extends or abridges the time limit. That sub rule would be rendered entirely otios if the words the date fixed for its hearing referred to the first effective hearing. There would never be any need to seek an extension of time or to have the court order an extension of time because every adjournment of the first fixed hearing would in effect operate as an extension of time. The final point, my lords, is one of certainty. An applicant must be able to calculate when an application notice is to be served. If the reference in Rule 12.93 is to be read as the learned judge held it should be, as referring to service being required 14 days before the first effective hearing, then the date for service will not necessarily be known by the applicant at the outset because the possibility of an adjournment of the first hearing is entirely hypothetical. And secondly, the date for service may change more than once. Indeed, an application for an extension may be made after the date required for service. It will lead to a huge amount of confusion on the part of both the applicant and the respondent. And so practically and logically, and having regard to the words used both in that rule and 12.8, it must be the case that the date fixed for its hearing can only mean the date set down by the court upon filing and then endorsed on the application notice. Indeed, I think in this case, the, although the application before Des Deputy District Judge Hebblethwaite was issued before the date, 14 days before the 9th yes. of July, it wasn't decided until after that. No, two days later, yes, my Lord. Was it two or three? The, the 14 days, the 14 clear days, presumably, no? Uh, by my calculation, I think the 14 days before was the 25th of June, um, and then the order of Deputy District Judge Hebblethwaite was the 27th of June. So the order, in effect, extending time came after the date for service. So on the 26th of June, the applicants were out of time, unless, well, they didn't know whether they were out of time because 
because because they didn't know whether the um, order was going to be made or not. I would say they, they were out of time. Because yes, on your on your on, on your construction. Yes. But on, on on the judge's construction, they didn't actually know on the twenty sixth of June whether they were out of time or not, because it would depend on what the deputy district judge did, which hadn't yet been done. Yes, I, I suspect at that point they were still out of time because there had been no adjournment. Um, but it illustrates the problem of a movable feast. Um, one simply doesn't know at what point one has to serve. So in this case, right up until the order of Deputy District Judge Hebblethwaite, the respondents to this appeal were obliged to serve on the 25th of June. That date passed before they were then given a second date for service. Yeah. Now, my lords, if that is not an extension of time, I don't know what is. There were two other reasons outside of the wording of the rules themselves why the learned judge below departed from the judgment of Deputy ICC Judge Prentice. The first related to a rejection by His Honour Judge Matthews of there being any obligation to serve insolvency proceedings promptly. Um, his conclusion for that reasoning was based on the fact that in this context an applicant has to wait to receive a sealed application notice from the court. But in reaching that finding in my submission, His Honour Judge Matthews failed to have regard to the following. Firstly, um, as is widely known and has long been the case, um, now under Rule 12.1 of the Insolvency Rules, the CPR are effectively imported into the Insolvency Rules unless disapplied or inconsistent with the rules. It is, of course, the policy under the Civil Procedure Rules that claim forms be served promptly uh, and applications be specifically served as soon as practic practicable after filing. So you don't have to serve a claim form promptly, do you? You, you, you can wait for the four months if you want to. Or is that... Well, Lord, I, I, rules? By serving promptly, I mean within the time limit set down by the CPR. Um, no encouragement to be lax as to those. Um, I accept there is a difference between the fact that there is an active encouragement in respect of applications to serve as soon as practicable, whereas in the context of a claim form, a claimant is free within that four-month or six-month period to serve when they choose. Um, but the policy behind imposing a time limit is to encourage the prompt and effective prosecution of proceedings after issue. <coughs> the distinction between Part 7 claims and insolvency proceedings um, doesn't stand also in practice because, of course, where a claimant elects to serve the claim form, they also have to wait to receive a sealed copy of the claim form from the court after issue. The same in respect of a claim for possession under Part 55 or an application made using an N244 form. There is no substantive difference between the role of the court in relation to those claims and applications as in insolvency proceedings. Well, isn't there a difference? Because as we've just been exploring, in the CPR context with claim forms, um, the claimant has four months in which to serve, and the court has no control over when within that four-month period the claimant serves, if indeed the claimant does so. Whereas in the insolvency context, it's quite different. There's no four-month period, and absolutely under the control of the court as to what the date is. Lord, I'm not sure that's entirely right, respectfully, because whilst there isn't a prospective time limit set by the insolvency rules, four months or six months, as in the case of the court claim form, what there is is a, a, a time period set calculated back from the first hearing, uh, which is similar to the case of a Part 20 application or indeed a part 55 possession. Yeah, but you might say that that's more favourable to the applicant because indeed. if the court is slow in processing a claim form, the court's slowness is eating into the period within which the claim form must be served, whereas if the court is slow in processing an application notice, time doesn't begin um, until the court has fixed the hearing, the, the, the venue. Yes, but the commonality and um, my lords, is that there is still an endpoint, albeit yeah. calculated differently, and the applicant is just as free to serve at any time up until that endpoint as they are with a claim form. 
the only element of court control relates to when the seal of application notice is sent out. Yeah. But that element of control is also present in the examples I've given of a Part 55 possession claim or an N244 application notice. That in itself cannot create the gulf of distinction that the learned judge uh, indicated between insolvency proceedings and Part 7 claim forms. Additionally, ultimately, particularly and perhaps only in the context of originating insolvency application notice, the purpose of service must serve the same purpose as a claim form. Um, those three purposes set out um, in the case of Hoddenot and Persimmon Homes, Wessex Limited, 2007, England and Wales Court of Appeal Civil 1203, which is quoted in a number of the cases but was specifically quoted by Judge Prentice in the HS Works case. The second criticism by the learned judge below of the reasoning of Deputy Lassie's <coughs> Judge Prentice related to early service maintaining regard for limitation periods. There are three policy justifications for limitation periods, and in my submission, these must apply equally in the context of insolvency proceedings, particularly originating applications where a limitation period is in play. The first of those is the position of the defendant. It is entirely unfair that a defendant, or a respondent in the case of insolvency applications, should have a claim hanging over them for an indefinite period. Secondly, lapse of time. Proving a claim, of course, becomes more difficult over time due to the likely destruction of documentary evidence and the fading of memories of witnesses. And finally, the conduct of the claimant. A person who doesn't act promptly to enforce their rights should lose them. In the case of a claim form, if that is issued on the last day or towards the end of the limitation period, those policy justifications are maintained by there being a four or six month period for service of the claim form. In the case of an insolvency application, the way to maintain the policy justifications behind having a limitation period is to ensure that an applicant does serve promptly on the respondent. If an application is issued and service doesn't occur promptly and perhaps there is an adjournment of the first hearing or an extension of time, then as in this case, an application may well have been issued on the very last day of the insolvency period, but those purposes, particularly notification of the defendant, are not being fulfilled. The defendant, the respondent, has no idea that proceedings are on foot and no idea of the nature of the claim against them. That must undermine the purpose of having a limitation period at all. So for those reasons, as I Judge Matthews was wrong to consider that the judgment of Judge Prentice was wrong, and wrong in his construction of Rule 12.93, and it follows that he should have found that the respondents in this case were obliged to serve by the 25th of June, and that if they, if they required an extension of time, one needed to be granted by the court. I then move, if I may, my Lord, to the question of what principles are applicable if an extension of time was required and was in effect sought by the respondent seeking adjournment. Can I ask you something which is puzzling me? Yes. The judge's judgment and your argument proceed on the basis that if the judge is right as to the construction of 12.9, that's really the end of the question. Because, because there's no breach of the rules. But it's accepted, I think on both sides, that the practical effect of the Deputy District Judge Applethwaite's order, by putting off the hearing date, did put off the time for service. Yes. Why does your argument not apply equally? Whoever's right about, about the construction of 12.9, because it's still an application, in effect, to put off the time for service. My Lord, our application was twofold. The first was having to deal with that order of Deputy District Judge Hebblethwaite to set it aside um, so that it left. Because as matters stand, the effect of that order was, in my submission, to grant an extension of time yes. so that the application was, in fact, served in time. Um, I 
think it would be very difficult for my clients to assert that where an application was served in time with the appro approval of the court, that they suffered such prejudice that the, the application ultimately should be struck out. Um, so we proceeded by way of seeking firstly to set aside the extension of time order, and secondly then, in circumstances where there had been a breach of the rules not approved by the court, seeking to strike out the originating application. But if you're right that the principles applicable to extensions of time for service of claim forms, having to take account of the expired limitation period, apply equally to extensions of time for service of the application, why, why, what, why is the application to vacate and relist the, the hearing, which is, as I say, I think accepted to be tantamount to giving an extension of time for service. Why is that not to be determined by the same principle? I don't, I don't see why, why it matters for that argument whether um, the, what rule 12.9 means. My Lord, we proceeded on the basis of an analogy to the position on a claim form, such yes. that if a claim form was not served within the four months, an application was made in time for an extension, and the court approved and granted that application, then unless an application was made to set aside the extension of time, then there was no issue with the claim form having been right. served late. And you didn't make an application? to set aside the extension of time within the seven days, or did you? Uh, an application was made to set aside, albeit I accept not within the, the seven day period. Um, as to that, my Lord, no issue was taken on that at first instance. Well, what's the seven day period? Uh, the usual provision, my Lord, that uh, where an order is made in the absence of a respondent. Is that in the insolvency rules? Is that important from the CPR? It's expressly in De Deputy District Judge Hebblethwaite's order. Right. It's, it's CPR 23.10. Yes. So it's a CPR applied to the insolvency rules? Yes. Right. I don't know if I've addressed your question fully. I'm not sure I fully understood it, but don't worry. You, I, you probably better carry on. I accept that the principle is applicable to an extension of time for a claim form as set down in, in Cecil and Bryant cannot apply exactly um, and that's because of the primary difference identified by His Honour Judge Matthews that if a claim form is not served in time by operation of the CPR it is void and a nullity. Can, can you just explain that to me because I'm I know it's common ground but I'm puzzled by it. What is it in the CPR that says that? I pull up. The judge refers to CPR Rule 7.5, but 7.5 doesn't tell you what the consequences of a failure to serve are. It just says you must serve within this period. And um, I, I'm not aware of anything that says that the claim form is Cinderella's coach, which turns into a pumpkin if you don't serve it. It's just that you can't do anything with it. Certainly my understanding uh, and that of my own firm before the judge is that uh, well, I think that used to be the case under the rules of the Supreme Court when they yes. governed procedure, but it doesn't seem to me at the moment that's what the CPR says. Practical consequence is, if you don't serve in time, you can't serve yes. without an extension, and if you can't serve, you can't bring the defendant before the court to get whatever relief you're after. Yes, and so must start again. But Yes, but why is that not equally applicable to an application under the insolvency rules. That's what I don't quite understand at the moment. Well, I, I, I of course, take that view. Um, perhaps if I try and explain and expound uh, what, in my view, I think the reasoning of the, the judge below was, um, there is an additional step in the context of insolvency proceedings. So where an insolvency application is not served in time, there is nothing in the rules that says it cannot be served out of time and cannot be proceeded with thereafter. What is in the rules is, uh, and indeed is Sorry, just stop, stop for a moment. So you can serve out of time without the permission of the court? The rules say you've got to serve by such and such a day. 
counted backwards from the hearing, but you say, well, it doesn't matter, you can serve late anyway. My Lord, I'm aware at risk of arguing against myself, um, but uh, I agree, it, and certainly, um, and it was a, a more recent decision of the Honourable Judge Matthews, where he said that Denton principles apply to an extension of time in, in the insolvency context. But so I don't think the CPR says you can't serve. It just says you must serve within this time. Yes. They go on to say, and you can't serve later. So it doesn't need to. But. And it's been under understood, I think, as in the case of Cecil and Byatt, that the consequence of not serving in time is, is that it's, it brings proceedings to an end, in effect. Yeah, because you can't go any further. Yes. Um, whereas there is nothing explicit in the Solvency Rules that says the same, although I entirely concur, my Lord, that it is right that the court would need to permit further time to be given where there is clearly a date for service. And there must be relevant considerations that apply when looking at whether an extension of time should be given. So even though um, there is provision in the insolvency rules that a defect or irregularity does not invalidate the proceedings, it, it's similar to Rule 3.10 of the CPR. That's not to say that there is not one consequence of not serving an insolvency application might be that it comes to an end because the court considers that it should be so invalidated. So whilst there may need to be an additional step, being a respondent applying, as my clients did, to strike out the application, as opposed to it being accepted that there is, as with a claim form, that it cannot be served and that proceedings are at an end and the claimant must start again, the consequence can still be the same, albeit with that additional procedural step with the onus falling on the respondent. I'm not sure I quite understand why. I think I'm having the same difficulties as my Lord Lord Justice Lewis and seeing what the real difference is and why you need an extra step. But if you take the case of a claim form, it's issued right at the end of a limitation period. The claimant has four months in which to serve. The claimant doesn't do so. The claimant goes before the master, gets an extension of time without drawing attention to the fact that the limitation period um, that's an ex parte application without notice. Then serves two months later. The, the defendant then applies to set aside the master's order, which was made without notice then, on the basis that it didn't comply with Cecil and Byatt principles. The service, the extension of time is set aside. The service is therefore bad. That's the end of the claim. What is the difference between that and your situation with the originating application? Well, Lord, I, I would take that view, and indeed that was the view of Her Honour Judge Walden Smith in Calcrew. Um, well, you I seem to be accepting that there was some significant difference between the two procedures, and I, I'm not at the moment entirely sure quite what the different difference is. Certainly the judge considered that the significant difference was um, that the, in the case of a claim for Nothing, no order of the court is needed to declare that it... Well, you'd have to set aside, in the case I postulated, you'd have to set aside the master's order extending time. Yes. And the basis for doing so would be it was in conflict with the Cecil and Byatt principle. Yes. Because ex hypothesis, the defendant's not on notice of that hearing and won't have appeared at the hearing. So has a right to set it aside. And that's what the defendant would do. And the consequence would follow that there'd not been good service and the claim wouldn't proceed. I think that, my lord, is the point that His Honour Judge Matthews took issue with. In the case of an insolvency application, if, as my clients did, at the first time a respondent has an opportunity to raise an objection, they seek to set aside the extension of time. The learned judge below considered that if they were successful in that application, that wouldn't necessarily mean that the Insolvency Act couldn't proceed. And I agree, there are difficulties with that, because then you have a situation where an insolvency application has been served out of time without permission of the court, but then is an applicant free to proceed upon it? In my submission, that simply cannot be the case. It seems be... a very odd conclusion. So yes. You, you get an extension, the judge is contemplating that you get an extension of time from the court on a without notice application. The respondent applies to set aside the <coughs> application, the extension. The application succeeds, but the applicant is then free to reserve. That does appear to be the conclusion of that the judge. That sounds. Well. Procedurally incoherent. Yes, uh, and really, um, the effect then, of it, even insofar as there is a difference, of the 
fact that a further order might be required to strike out the originating claim, um, because this is an application and not a claim form, um, really makes no difference to the substantial point that your lordship is supposed to put. Yeah, so well, it, and it's in the judge's judgment at paragraphs 25 and 26 is really where he talks about this. So I don't at the moment understand paragraph 25. And I don't really understand the difference that he's drawing between the claim form and an originating application um, in insolvency proceedings. Um, my Lord, Maybe I'm that's Mr. Fennell will have to explain that to me, but I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand either paragraph. At the moment. Um, my Lord, as, as respect, um, that does call upon my learned friend, um, but uh, I respectfully agree um, that the distinction just isn't there. Um, and the points made in terms of what actually happens in practice are not borne out. Um, can I ask a different question? This goes back to a question you were asked by my Lord Lord Justice Nugent earlier, which is, take the case which is indeed this case, where the application or claim form was issued last day of the li limitation period. And let's take it the insolvency context. Um, and so the applicant has got a date from the court for the first hearing and it's four months away. So even on your construction um, of Rule 12.9, they've got three and a half months in which to serve. Yes. Now, suppose that during that three and a half month period, they apply to the court for a later date. They want to put it back by one month. Now, what's the relevance of the limitation period to that application if made within the original four and three and a half month period? Because it's not been served on the defendant yet, um, and um, th that non-service is in accordance with the, the original court order. Yes. So what's the relevance of limitation to putting back the date of service, My given that it was issued within time, and so far as service is concerned, um, the only difference from the def def defendant's perspective is that the time permitted by the court for service is enlarged. Well, the point is exactly the same as if it were a claim form and an in-time application of extension for time was made. The courts have held that it is relevant to consider that the limitation period has expired before service, and therefore that must be weighed in the balance. Now, it may be the case that if the, uh, the applicant has been unable to serve the respondent, and the court will no doubt, as Judge Prentice did in HS Works, take into account that less than four months has been given in that initial period of service, it may be the court considers that there is a good reason which outweighs any limitation concern. The point... Well, uh, but you see, that's the point, isn't it? Because it's not black and white. No. Um, as I understand it, you accept that even the putting your case at its highest, limitation is not an absolute bar. It's merely a relevant consideration. So therefore, on what basis do you say that... Um, District Judge Hebblethwaite's order ought to be reversed. I mean, at your highest, the conclusion would be that um, his order should be set aside and the matter should be reconsidered. My Lord, the, the relevance of the principles as to the claim form is that the loss of uh, the expiry of limitation post issue and pre service becomes the primary question. But it is not always the case that where limitation is expired, no extension of time will be given. The criticism of the order of Judge Hebblethwaite insofar as it extended time is twofold. Firstly, and this may well be determinative, is that no good reason for that extension of time was given by the respondents. I think the reason advanced was they wanted to serve the defendant or respondent who was out of the jurisdiction at the same time. That there was, that was the two, reason. two reasons in, in effect retrospectively advanced, one in respect to obtaining insurance and funding, 
which the judge accepted was not a reason since that was all on foot right. on the day of issue. And secondly, as you say, my Lord, the point about having to serve one of the respondents out of the jurisdiction. Um, that uh, um, um, were, the, were those reasons put before the Deputy District Judge so as to persuade her to adjourn? Or was it just a, can we please adjourn, tick the box? The, the only uh, witness date was given in support of the application to adjourn, and it largely dealt with the test for serving out of the jurisdiction. It noted that none of the other respondents had been served and said that the intention was to serve everyone together. And that I was thought really that was the reason it was put before. Yes. So was the insurance funding reason put before the Deputy District Judge? No. So she approached the case on the basis that the reason uh, was a desire to serve all the defendants, all the respondents together. Since there wasn't actually, in terms, an application of an extension of time. No, no, I'll follow. Yes. But yes, she, she approached it on the basis that the, the applicants had said they simply wanted yeah. to serve everyone. Considering then whether um, there is a similar approach to extensions of time on insolvency applications as under claim forms, um, the first point is really to consider the purpose of the service of proceedings. And in my submission, the purpose of serving a claim form is exactly the same as the purpose of serving an originating application, which in effect is a substantive claim, albeit under the guise of an insolvency act application notice of the requirements of the Act or the rules. The purposes have been set out in the Hodgnot case. Um, firstly, notifying the defendant that the claim has commenced formal litigation and informing them of the nature of the claim. Secondly, enabling the defendant to participate in proceedings and have some say in the way they are prosecuted. And finally, to enable the court to control the litigation process. The judge below took issue final purpose um, and I accept that the latter may be of slightly less importance in this context um, because the first hearing is set down upon issue as opposed to after service of the claim form and exchange of statements of case but it must still be relevant to insolvency proceedings the usual practice of the court is to give directions at the first hearing akin to a case management conference uh, and it will be unlikely to be able to do so if the application has not been served before the first hearing. So there is still, an, of course, an element of court control and case management in the context of these applications. It is, of course, now well established, as I have said, that the expiry of a limitation period post-issue and pre-service is a key consideration on considering um, an application to extend time for service of a claim form. The reasons for that are as follows respectfully adopt the reasoning of Lord Justice Ricks in the Cecil and Byatt case. Proceedings are commenced when issued, not served, and time therefore stops the limitation period at the point of issue, not service. But if a defendant is not put on notice of the proceedings and does not know the nature of the claim against him, um, which doesn't happen until proceedings are served, um, then there is an increasing likelihood that the defendant will assume that he is not going to be bothered by litigation after the limitation period has expired. So it was said by Lord Justice Ricks in both the Actors case and Cecil that the period between issue and service is akin to an extension to the limitation period, albeit one that is <coughs> sanctioned by the procedural rules and is part of the system. And that is because during that four month period, uh, the claimant isn't obliged to do anything to bring the, bring the proceedings formally to the notice of the defendant. As I have said, the existence of limitation periods is justified by a desire to prevent the spectre of proceedings hanging over a defendant and to encourage the efficient prosecution of proceedings. Those policy reasons are wholly undermined if an unjustified extension of time for service is granted where the limitation period has expired post-issue. There was some discussion and argument before the So post-issue, but I mean, as we've gone over already, I mean, that's true either way. I mean, this is a, a case where the, 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 the claim is issued, as it were, on the last day of the limitation period. So the only question 
question is what's the therefore in that in that circumstance the impact of an extension of time for cert? Yes, um, being that if the proceedings are brought to an end by there being no extension of time for service, a claimant or an applicant couldn't start again because there would be an absolute limitation defence. Yeah, and, and could I ask you one more time for your submission as to the, the relevance of there being no fixed period for service in this context? Because is there not a difference conceptually between a system where you've got a fixed period within which to issue by virtue of the limitation period, and then a further fixed period within which to serve by virtue of the rules of court, um, as against a system whereby you've got the first of those but not the second. Well, it's, you, to use your expression earlier, it's inherently a movable feast. Well, the, the first, well, in the sense of looking at all proceedings, there is never going to be the precise, the first hearing is never going to be set down at precisely the same date from issue in every set of insolvency proceedings. What well, well, exactly? So you might have one case. Imagine two cases issued on the same day. In both cases, it's the last day of the limitation period. There's no difference. And in one case, the court, for court reasons, gives a, a first date for hearing four months away. Yes. And in another case, it's only two months away. Yes. So as compared to the second case, the defendant in the first case is prejudiced because they may be served two months later and it's purely adventitious as a result of court decision over which they've had no say whatsoever. Well, or perhaps the important distinction is in the nature of what is issued. So in a Part 7 claim, one issues a claim form, but the particulars of claim may follow at any point thereafter. The important thing is serving the claim form. Now, in an insolvency context, what one has to issue is an uh, uh, Insolvency Act application notice supported by a witness statement, uh, which in this case also exhibited draft points of claim. In effect, all elements which were required to be served are ready at the point of issue, which is not necessarily the case in a claim form, particularly where a claim form is being issued protectively because one is at the end of a limitation period. So whilst I accept that in principle, an insolvency applicant may have a shorter period of time to serve than they would have done if they'd issued a claim form, they, in our, they are in a sense ready to go from the point of issue. And of course it works both ways. In many cases an applicant may be given far longer than the four month period. But in either case there is still a fixed period of time. It's not fixed by the rules, it's fixed by what the court does when it, on your case, puts and endorses the venue on the application notice. Fixed by a combination of the rules and indeed the, the hearing given by the court. And of course, the court has the power, as noted in 12.93c, to extend or abridge the time limit for service. And so it may be that a direction can be sought respect of when an application has to be served if the first hearing is listed very shortly after the issue, or indeed the requirement to service be entirely dispensed with. Well, as I, re I revert to um, the comments in argument by the learned judge below as to limitation periods generally in insolvency proceedings, and the distinction that he sought to draw between what he termed private law litigation and insolvency proceedings. That is a false distinction. It has been established for some time now and is not in doubt that in limitation periods apply to the actions of insolvency practitioners under the provisions of the Insolvency Act 1986. As noted by Sir Martin Norton in the judgment of this court in Hill and Spread Trustee, there is no reason why the provisions of the Limitation Act would not apply to an action by a trustee in bankruptcy. So, if limitation expires after issue but before service of proceedings, a delay in serving gives rise to the same issues in insolvency proceedings as it does in a Part 7 claim. If one accepts that the purpose of service of an originating insolvency application is the same as the purpose of service of a claim form, and that a delay in service of an insolvency application undermines the existence of a limitation period, 
just as it does in the case of delaying service of claim form. It must follow that limitation is as irrelevant a factor in extending the time for service of an Insolvency Act application notice as it is in the service of a claim form. <clears throat> There's been some discussion already here as to whether there truly is a procedural distinction between a claim form being uh, described as automatically null and void if served out of time and insolvency application only being validated if the court so orders. Insofar as your lordships consider there is a distinction, I would submit that that is no basis um, to say that a respondent to an originating application in insolvency proceedings cannot, when they first have the opportunity to object to the extension of time, assert that the expiry of limitation post-issue and pre-service is a ground on which to set aside an extension of time for service. I have already referred to the fact that the issue of limitation is relevant to extensions of time for proceedings in other contexts, including, for example, a Part 20 claim, where the same process uh, as in an insolvency application, is gone through to set the date for service, being a number of days in, uh, before a hearing set down. What's the authority for that? Uh, that's Haskew and Pannoni LLP and others, 2013, England Wales Court of Appeal, Civil 350. We got that? What is is that in our bundle? Uh, it, it's quoted in the Calcare and Holmes decision at paragraph 36. The courts have stated time just and... Just a moment, just, oh, just, can you just show us yes, what's course. being quoted? So we are in tab 15, and it's paragraph 36, the discussion of the point I've just made. 38, did you say? 36. 36. So that, 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 you say, is analogous to the way in which time for service is fixed under the insolvency rules. Indeed, and an example of the court considering that even where there is a different method of ascertaining the date for service, the principles in Cecil and Barnes are still applicable, the same policy justifications underlying them. Yeah. Right. Further, it is a key part of the overriding objective and uh, the approach of the courts to litigation that uh, parties comply with the rules. So under the CPR and indeed under the 2016 rules, even where failure to comply with a particular rule doesn't render those proceedings void or null or invalid, there is still a process by which the court can order the same. Uh, in the insolvency rules, that is rule 12.64, and in the civil procedure rules, that is rule 3.10. As noted um, by the judge in the Calcrane Holmes decision, a respondent to an insolvency application can suffer substantial prejudice if an extension of time deprives them of a strong argument <coughs> that the proceedings should be struck out in reliance upon dilatoriness of the office holder both pre-issue in issuing at the very end of limitation and post-issue in not serving promptly. You're entitled to wait until the last of the limitation period. There's nothing wrong with that. No, my lord, I, I entirely accept that. But if then there is a further delay post-issue, that requires an explanation. I see. Okay. The final point of the judgment and, and really the decision on um, my client's application given by the judge um, was that in considering whether, and again Oberter, um, the order of Deputy District Judge Hebblethwaite should be set aside, the judge took into account the reasons given by the respondents uh, and considered those to be good reasons, but gave no weight to the prejudice suffered by my clients in the fact that they were served with proceedings seven months after issue, two months after, on my case, the date for service again absent good reason. And in my submission, the learned judge was wrong in reaching that conclusion and upholding the extension of time. 
In considering that the judge was wrong to find that the respondent's this appeal had a good reason for seeking extension, um, I think the learned judge accepted that the reasons as to funding and ATE insurance were rightly criticised by my clients and did not form part of the learned judge below's reasoning. What he did find persuasive was the respondent's contention that they wanted the proceedings to be case managed together. Yeah, and that was the only one point that was actually in the evidence. I mean, there's nothing about that I can find in the witness statement to Ms. Unsworth dated the 7th of June um, about the insurance funding. But what he does say is that um, uh, what they want is, is, is in effect a common timetable. Yes, my lord. The, there was a, a, a contradiction really in the evidence. It was said that ATE insurance funding was up, uh, in place as at the 30th of January last year, as the date of issue, and also confirmed that the respondent's legal team are acting on conditional fee agreements. Hence the criticism by my client of that being advanced as a reason for seeking an extension of time, because it appeared that those issues had been resolved as at the date of issue. As to whether this contention about there being a common timetable um, amounts well, to... Could we just look at what the evidence was? I think of course it's, uh, it's tab four of the supplemental time. Apologies, my lord. Um, yes, the, the reasons in respect of insurance and AT funding were given in later evidence to yeah, justify... Yes, but, but we need to surely to concentrate on what was before the deputy district judge. Yes. Which is... Paragraphs 28 and 29. Uh, and indeed 27, yes, my lord. But, but, well, indeed, yes, you're right to point that out. But, but the, 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 so far as the adjournment is concerned, the point they make is that um, following service on Mr Burnett, who's out of the jurisdiction, he's got 24 days to respond. And the idea, therefore, is to have a directions hearing um, at a point when uh, he has been properly served. Yes, a, a perfectly legitimate request from adjournment, but it doesn't explain why my clients were not served when they should have been. Um, simply wanting a common timetable or adjourning off the first hearing so that directions can be given after all the parties are served is not a reason not to serve parties within the jurisdiction where their contact details are known, where in respect of certainly my corporate client, there has been pre-action correspondence with solicitors on record. Um, the, the other parties were ready, willing and able to be served, and they were not served, uh, and there is no good reason for that. So what they should have done, you say, is they should have served your client and at the same time said, we are going to serve Mr Burnett. We think it would be a good idea to adjourn this date of the 9th of July so that there can be a common directions hearing for everybody. Indeed. There may be, my Lord, criticisms about the delay in making the application to serve out, considering that it was known that Mr Burnett was out of the jurisdiction. Well, that's a different point. It is a different point. Um, but doesn't really turn on the main point, as you say, my lord, that there is no reason why service could not have been effected on my clients, and then an application for an adjournment of the first hearing made on the basis there was no point giving directions at two separate hearings. As to that, of course, that the case against the respondent out of the jurisdiction is really entirely separate to that against the other respondents, um, so there is no real need, um, other than perhaps the cost savings having a collective trial for those two strands of the application to be managed together in any event. Yes. My Lord, unless I can assist any further, um, that uh, those are my submissions on, on the first substantive right. so can, can I just ask you one question? You referred to the originating application, which is the application issued at the end of January. Yes. Um, I was just looking in the rules. I couldn't find... Uh, there used to be under the 1986 rules a distinction between an originating application and an ordinary application. But I can't find it in the 2016 rules. Is it still there somewhere? Uh, I, I'm not aware that it is, my Lord. I had understood it was simply a, a linguistic approach to distinguish between...
between an application akin to a claim form and then a substantive a application. I, indeed, indeed. Yes. yes. Lord, if, if I could, perhaps being older than my learned friend and remembering <laughs> this, um, an originating application was something that was normally used in something like a creditor's voluntary liquidation where the insolvency wasn't before the court. Yes. And then you'd have an ordinary application then in the bankruptcy. And, I, thought, and, and, I thought once yes. you had a petition in a bankruptcy, all applications were ordinary applications. That's okay. correct, yes. But if you wanted to make, say, a, a, sec um, a preference claim in a creditor's voluntary liquidation, yes, that's not a court procedure. So you'd have an originating application, so the court office would know that originating application on the face of it, they've got to give it a new number and open a new file instead of going to this archive and finding the old file. That went with the 2016 rules when we now have the form of IAA that you have to use in all cases. Thank you. Okay, very grateful to my learned friend. Right, so now on to the summary judgment point, are we? Yes, my lord, and I hope I can deal with this far quicker than right. my other submissions. It, it's a very short point, um, and an alternative to our primary case. Um, if I take your lordships to the case, uh, it relates only to Mr. House. Um, the, uh, the application notice of, of January 2019 is at tab one of the supplemental grant. What is set out in terms of the relief sought um, is two declarations in respect of two separate payments made, the first to the third respondent and the second to my corporate client, and then at C, consequential orders against, in effect, the onward recipients of the payment to the corporate client. The position is put in the draft points of claim behind tab two as against my against Mr. House is slightly different. Um, if I take your lordships to paragraph 34 of the draft points of claim, at page 12, what is set out there is an extract from an affidavit of Mrs. I listing the ultimate destination of payments um, following the receipt by my corporate client of the payment from Mrs. I. And your lordships will see there um, the penultimate listed payment. 11th of April 12, payment to Peter House. What was said at paragraph 35 is that, in effect, those matters are beyond the knowledge of the respondents to this appeal. One then moves to the specific case against Mr House, and that is at paragraph 46, page 14. If the court finds that the sum of £72,000 was in fact paid by HH to Mr House, and then what is sought is relief um, pursuant to section 339 or 423. So a slightly different case than simply seeking consequential orders when the primary cause of action is against my court power. In, event, in any event, what is clear from the pleaded case that the entire cause of action, whether it's consequential or direct against Mr House, relies on a transfer of the sum of £72,000 odd from my corporate client to Mr House. And the date um, that suggested for that is the 11th of April 2012. In my submission, therefore, the respondent's case falls or succeeds at least prima facie on whether that payment was actually made. What was before his Honour Judge Matthews um, was a raft of documentary evidence um, showing on my client's case that there was no transfer to Mr House personally, and then further explanation as to why in fact those monies were retained by my corporate client and applied towards outstanding invoices. I, I don't think I need to take your Lordships to that further explanation evidence but it is worth reviewing the bank statements as really the primary evidence in this case. They're at tab 10 of the supplementary bundle. What was said by um, HH was that it only had two bank accounts. That evidence was not contested uh, by the trustee. The first has been referred to in effect the trading account. The bank statements for that begin at page one to one. Um, my lords, you will see 
towards the bottom of page 121, on the 11th of April, there is receipt of the £485,000 in from Mrs Ide. And then on the same day, a transfer went of a large portion of that sum. Now that transfer went to another of the company's accounts, and the statement for that is at page 156. On page five, 156, roughly around the second hole punch, um, you can see, my lords, on the 11th of April, there is a receipt in of the 461,000 figure that came out of the trading account. No other transfers other than back to the trading account, apart from a transaction on the 16th of April 2012 to Mr Webb, who is another respondent to the underlying proceedings. Now, nowhere, and it was, I think, accepted by the Lord Brown and indeed the judge, nowhere in the bank statements is there any evidence of the sum of £72,000 odd going to Mr House, either on the 11th of April or at all. In my submission, the learned judge below was right to identify the principles as set out in the cases quoted in his judgment, the Free Rivers District Council in EDNF Manlit and Products. They are trite principles. But in my submission, he erred in applying those principles to this case. The bank account evidence that I've taken your lordships to entirely contradicts any assertion by the respondents that my client received any money of Mrs Ives. That in itself, in my submission, should have been sufficient for the learned judge below to conclude that the respondent's case had no real prospect of success. It simply cannot be the case that where, in a very straightforward case such as this, the key allegation relies upon a bank transfer of <coughs> funds, that the case must go to trial if the bank statements show that the transfer didn't happen, simply because there is some affidavit evidence that the payment was made, particularly whereas in this case the affidavit evidence was unsupported by documentary evidence. I accept that on the face of it, there is a conflict of evidence, but not one that justified a trial, because the key documentation, the bank statements, contradicted the statement of facts put forward, rather hesitantly, by the trustees. And so for those reasons, the Judge Matthews was wrong in my submission to refuse some of the judgment. Unless I can assist further, that those are the grounds of appeal. Thank you very much, Ms. Powers. Yes, Mr. Fenn. Uh, my lord, I'm grateful. Uh, my lord, I'll start by dealing with the um, statements. Before I start, uh, I need to thank the court and the court staff. Um, we weren't originally meant to be live streamed. That's been accommodated to meet my solicitor's needs. She's shielding. Uh, the court accommodated that at relatively short notice, and we're very, very grateful. Um, my Lord, if I could move on to um, the power of the court to transfer. Yeah. My learned friend's first ground of appeal. Uh, my Lord, you've got um, my skeleton, and I won't repeat that, um, but my starting point is Rule 1.1, brackets 2, of the insolvency rule says that unless the context otherwise requires, mm -hmm. the proceeding bears a particular meaning. And so it is open to the court to decide that the context otherwise requires. Um, my learned friend relies on the EU regulation. Sorry, as a what, what, I beg your pardon. I'm sorry. What, what, what are you looking at? 1.1? 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. The definition. Oh, I see. Unless yes. the context requires it. Yes. yes. And I place great weight on those words because, as I hope to go on to demonstrate, the term proceedings is used in a number of different ways within the rules and also with the EU regulation to which my learned friend um, referred. Yes. 
And so, my lord, if we look at the EU regulation, um, my submission is that any reliance on that is entirely misconceived because the word proceedings in the regulation, which is at tab, tab four of the authorities bundle, the word proceedings has a specific definition for the purpose of the regulation, which in short is the purpose of mutual recognition of insolvency proceedings and avoidance of conflicts between different member states. Uh, and one will see there that um, uh, proceedings are defined by re relevance to particular processes. It's the um, definition that my learned friend referred to. Yeah, and uh, XA. At part A, yes. Now, of course, that definition um, does not include receivership. But the insolvency rules do include receivership. And they still have administrative receivership for what it's worth. Is that one of parts one to eleven? Yes, it's part three. Thank you. I, I apologise. It's, it's not part three, but it, it, it is in there. It's um. Part four is receivership, rules 4.1 4.24. And they include things like court applications to fix re uh, receiver's fees, which can be challenged. So the rules do apply. The insolvency rules apply to things which the regulation does not. The regulation is its own distinct thing. Uh, my, Lord, my fundamental point is that as I say in the skeleton, the court has to give proceedings uh, its ordinary word, its ordinary meaning. Um, and for example, uh, my learned friend referred to Rule 12.64. Which is in the bundle behind tab 5. And that says, no insolvency proceedings will be invalidated by any formal defect or irregularity unless the court before which objection is taken uh, considers that substantial injustice has been caused by the defect or irregularity. And that injustice cannot be remedied by any order of the court. And my learned friend took you, my lord, to that um, provision in the context of a question, what happens if you're successful on the first round of appeal? Well, on my learned friend's interpretation, the word no insolvency proceedings only means the bankruptcy or the winding up. What I say it means is um, a proceeding brought in the bankruptcy or the winding up as well. So if a trustee... Con conversely, yes. um, I suppose on Miss Power's construction, if one were to consider that her clients have been caused a substantial injustice by the extended service of the originating application in this case, on her interpretation, the whole insolvency proceedings would be invalidated. So Mrs. Ide would be back to square one. That can't be right, my lord, can it? Doesn't sound right. Uh, and so we say that 12.64 has a wide meaning. If a trustee in bankruptcy issues a preference claim well within the limitation period and serves it properly but gets something procedurally wrong, then the preference claim remains valid unless the respondent to it suffers an injustice and the court decides to set aside that application against that individual. Um, and but so, 1264 wouldn't require you to set aside the whole, insult, the whole bankruptcy? No, no. no. But it must give the court the power to uh, retrospectively rectify procedural errors in relation to applications, ordinary applications in the old parlance within the bankruptcy. So I suppose what you're really saying is the definition of insolvency proceedings is really concentrating on the insolvency part yes. of the definition rather than the proceedings part. Yes, exactly. Uh, 
My Lord, um, in the course of argument, my learned friend submitted that there is always a common case number. Uh, it's not for me to give evidence, but it's my submission that there isn't always a common case number. The court can allocate a different case number to a specific application within a bankruptcy. Is there anything in the rules that deals with this? Or is no, it's not. Of practice, is it? it, it's a matter of practice, and, and one assumes it comes from the general power of case management in uh, CPR 3. It's certainly not, a, not, not expressly provided for in the rules, but one sees it happening. If you've got a bankruptcy where there's three or four heavy applications happening at the same time, the court might give them different numbers. Files under file that big doesn't appear on the judge's desk every time it comes before him. That, that does happen, and it is not unusual. And it's my submission that's an entirely appropriate way for it to, to happen, and it follows from an example that um, the court gave earlier. What happens when you've got something like a block transfer of anything else? Do you need the whole file? And the answer is no. Um, if the whole of the bankruptcy is being transferred, the court gets the whole file and the OR gets told. If a specific little bit of the bankruptcy, an application gets transferred, then the court can have the file in relation to that and the OR doesn't need to trouble himself because he's carrying on his proceedings in the original court. Um, why wouldn't you notify the OR well, that the particular application... You, you would if you needed to be um, served and you, you probably would tell him but it's, 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 it's less pressing than the entirety of the bankruptcy yeah. going because he needs to know which court his bankruptcy is in. What is the role of the OR once trustees have been appointed? Um, they still retain residual roles. They have to still carry out certain investigations. They can apply for bankruptcy restriction orders in particular. And it's the BRO aspect that's, that's most pressing. And so if the OR is going to apply for bankruptcy restriction order, he will do that and he needs to know which court to do it in. Um, in practice, the OR seems to do less and less as time goes on, but he still retains a general investigatory power, and so if he's trying to investigate what the bankrupt has done for his own purposes, perhaps in the context of BRO or for some other reason, then the OR has the power to apply for public examination, for example, um, which, again, he needs to know what court is seized with the bankruptcy so that he can make that application to the right place. But except in the context of a BRO, one would imagine the OR usually allows trustees in post to get on with. That's everybody's experience for a very long time, my lord. Yes, I see. Thank you. Um, perhaps just to, 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 to um, fill in one, one, one gap, it's a procedural point. Um, there are points where um, things like the OR's sanction is still required for certain things uh, and for, for, for giving, giving powers. Uh, where that is required, again, you need to know which court you're in. Um, my Lord, moving on, uh, my Lord, your friend referred you to the two earlier High Court authorities. Um, I've referred to uh, Lord Newberger in Lehman Brothers. It's my recollection, in response to uh, Lord Justice Lewison's comment, that there are many other cases um, in the House of Lords and indeed in this court which say that um, the 86 Act and the rules are a completely new code. But uh, I will make a copy available of um, paragraph 12 of Lord Newberger, um, it's judgment in Lehman, because it's a point in my learned friend's favour. Um, and Lord Newberger says, says, where the wording of the provision has not changed from that provision of previous legislation, at least prima facie, it may normally be assumed that the effect of the provision was intended to be unaltered. Uh, that's the point from Bennion. But in the same paragraph, um, uh, Lord Newberger says, when it comes to less fundamental procedures and rules, it cannot be assumed that judicial decisions, even at the highest level, relating to previous legislation, still hold good. <clears throat> now, there is an authority which I say is relevant here you weren't taken, and that's the decision of this court in Clark against Coops and Co., which is at tab 10 of the authority. It was 
was referred to by Mr Justice Coulson, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, Mr Justice Coulson referred to two cases in his judgment. Uh, the first one was Callaghas and Piercy, which is another judgment of the High Court. Um, that was Judge Baker's judgment. Yes. And then you've got um, the Clark decision, which is the Court of Appeal. Yeah. Uh, the case is not entirely on point because it doesn't deal with a transfer application. Uh, what the facts here were is that um, a debtor, who it might be said was abusing the system, applied for an interim order um, for an IVA, which prevents proceedings being brought against him. Uh, Coots was the bank that he owed money to, and it was applying for a charging order. And the debtor didn't tell Coots or the court about his interim order, and Coots went and got an absolute charging order. Um, and so the question was, um, where, which court um, had to give leave for the making of the charging order? Because ordinarily, leave would be given by the county court to which the application for the interim order was made. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the Court of Appeal decided that the High Court dealing with the charging order had the authority um, to make an order in the IVA without transferring it. And so the question was about the jurisdiction of the court rather than the power to transfer. Um, but if I could take your lordships to page four, paragraph 49 and paragraph 50, which is at internal page 926. Um, court appeal here uh, is citing the judgment um, from Callaghas and Percy is on a Judge Baker's judgment and there's a large quote from that at paragraph 49 deciding that the High Court has got the power to make orders in an IVA or in a bankruptcy uh, but then there's the paragraph 50 that I rely on as a statement of principle that should guide the court here um, Lord Justice Rick says, in my judgment, Parliament was deliberately seeking to avoid points on jurisdiction being taken in bankruptcy proceedings, such as used to be the regular practice prior to the 1986 Act coming into force. Uh, that provision, I, that principle, I say, should guide the court here. Um, the fundamental point is that the county court needs to be able to send a complicated matter to the High Court and to keep less complicated matters itself. I give you the example in my skeleton of uh, a difficult um, case involving, say, transactions that have references, which is suitable for trial in the High Court. And at the same time, the debtor's got a house, and the trustee is making an application for possession and sale of the house, which is county court work. In my submission, it can't be right to say that you have to keep all the proceedings together because if that's right then either a county court deals with something that should be in the high court or a high court judge is going to be dealing with the possession and sale application. Well does that follow? As uh, I think Ms Powers told Lord Justice Nugy uh, it can be transferred up to the high court and then back to the county court. My Lord, so, that, that, so my, all, all, her only point is that everything's got to move together. Yes. She doesn't say it can only move once. No, but, but if you've got the preference claim going on and the possession sale going on at the same time, yes. involving entirely different people... Yes, well, then uh, there, 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 <laughs> they, there, there'll they, be a paralysis of giving directions. Yes. 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 You, you, the court doesn't want it zigzagging between the high court and the high court back again. Yes, what, what, in that respect, it's different from the block transfer scenario. Because on the block transfer scenario, if it's effectively instantaneous, while the High Court judge is considering the application, which doesn't take too long, <laughs> <laughs> it's transferred to the High Court, and then 
instantly transferred back again. Well, look, yes, that's right. Um, but one does not want zigzagging around with a possession sale application, on my example. Yeah. And so, well, Lord, for those reasons, um, I say that uh, Judge Matthews was entirely acting within his jurisdiction uh, to transfer this particular application to himself in the High Court um, in order to deal with um, the Caltrain challenge that I made on that occasion. Yeah. Uh, Lords, I note that it's five to one, or five yeah. to two, because they haven't altered Can I just ask you yes. one more point before you leave that? Uh, is 12, Rule 1231 of any assistance to you? That's the one which says if you start proceedings in the wrong court, they can either be retained or transferred. Um, well, Lord, I don't think it does help me. I wish it did. The reason why I say it doesn't is that it talks about proceedings being commenced in the wrong court. There's no suggestion that anything was commenced in the wrong court here. The question is whether the court can transfer something that was, that was commenced in the right court. No, but if insolvency proceedings means the bankruptcy as a whole, yes. you could have a bankruptcy started in, in the county court. Someone could then issue a high court application or in the wrong yes. hearing centre. Um, but if insolvency proceedings means the proceedings as a whole, those that application wouldn't come within the words insolvency proceedings commenced in the wrong court. Well, yes, that, that's correct. And, and one does see that happen. Um, it's not unknown for somebody to issue an application, particularly in the, in the district registries, in the wrong district registry. You think you're in Manchester, but actually you're in Leeds. Um, administrators have been known to do that. All right. Well, those and, are my uh, I think you'd obviously prefer to break there and come back. To I, the, I, I was going to say, Morris, I'm in your hands. I can see it's almost yeah, one well, o'clock. Yeah, that's fine. And I finished my submissions. Again, at five to two. Yes. Five All to right. two.